But, you know, meeting Warren Buffett, to me, it was like shaking his hand and looking at him. It, it was a little intimidating because I know he's trying to read me. A and I'm looking at him and, and I'm trying to read him, I guess. <laughs> Dr. Todd Finko is a national award-winning author of the book, Warren Buffett, Investor and Entrepreneur. Published by Columbia University Press, the book has been translated into 13 languages, inspiring people worldwide to learn from Buffett's strategies. As a professor, Dr. Finkel and his students have had the fortunate opportunity to be invited to Omaha three times to meet and learn from Warren Buffett for a day. In this interview, we will explore the secret wisdom Buffett unveiled to Dr. Finko and his students and discover the valuable lessons Buffett has for us. I think the thing that really that people love about Warren Buffett and why we go to the shareholder meeting, there's 40,000 people that go to the shareholder meeting every year, is because they trust him. Sure, they want to learn about investments, but they know he's not going to be lying to them. He just loves to teach. He loves people and he wants to help people, period. You have to be entrepreneurial today. You have to think differently than what everybody else is doing. And that's true in investments as well. There, there is something that he said that, that had resonated with me. Uh, and I think about it almost every day. Now, the first time I get to meet Dr. Talk, it was actually through the recent book show, Hathaway AGM. And I actually came across his book on LinkedIn first, right? Because he actually posted that he wrote a book about Warren Buffett. And this book is a national award winner, has been translated to multiple now, multiple language. So at that time, when I read this LinkedIn post, I was like, okay, I got to make sure I, I get this <laughs> copy when I go to Berkshire. And just nice, he was also there to do a book signing section. So that's how I managed to grab this copy of the book and actually have Dr. Top to sign for me. And he's also very nice to actually accept my invitation when I ask him, is it okay that I actually do a podcast interview with you so that you can share more insights about what you learned from Buffett, your journey. And he is so kind to be with us today. So once again, for that, can we, everybody type thank you in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Top for being here. Well, th thank you, Chloe. You're, uh, you're doing some amazing things. You're quite the, the little entrepreneur. And I love entrepreneurs. Thank you. Uh, let me first start off with the first question. Um, Dr. Todd Finkel, are you able to just share with us a little bit more about yourself first, right? What actually get you started in this journey? And how has Buffett inspired you in the entire process of you becoming who you are today? I, I think I should start out by saying that uh, the process of writing this book, uh, I really didn't decide to write it until about five years ago full time, but it took me 14 years in total, uh, nine years of doing research and then another five of, of writing full time and interviewing people. So it, it was quite <laughs> an amazing effort. And a couple of friends of mine really helped me out with this. This is doing something of this magnitude you can't do on your own. You need help from people. So I, I had a little uh, help from a friend of mine from grade school that I've known since I was nine years old. His name's Charlie Fishkin, and he's written a couple books. And so he helped me out with that. And uh, one of them was published by uh, University of Chicago, or yeah, University of Chicago Press. Uh, and also another friend of mine, Matt Koffler, who's a CFA. And he helped me out with uh, the evaluation aspect of the book, because to me, that was uh, probably the hardest part was trying to figure out the secret sauce of Warren Buffett. Just because he says that he uses the discounted cash flow, <laughs> you know, it's easier said than actually calculating it and doing it in the real world. That's a little bit of the background on the book. Of course, it got picked up by uh, uh, Columbia University Press, Miles Thompson there, who's also put out a book with uh, Robert Hagstrom. Uh, Robert Hagstrom is probably the most well-known author of Warren Buffett. 
he's put out several books about them and, and there uh, one of them was the Warren Buffett way which is a New York Times bestseller and I actually was sitting next to him at the uh, uh, book signing he was right next to me and he oh. said that he read my book and he really liked my book and he actually <laughs> this is funny he actually quoted my book in his new book oh. about Buffett. so he opened it up and he showed me exactly where he quoted me. So I thought that was kind of cool. That you was know, because Robert cool. Haystrom's big time. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, I and I think from this we can see that it's really a lot of effort and thought and dedication behind the work that you actually put out. Um, people usually think that, oh, wow, probably it didn't need a lot of uh, time to actually write a book. In fact, when you told me you, it took five years for you to really become like, where is it? To write it. But, you know, I, I uh, for nine years, I took students to go visit Warren Buffett. Hmm. So I took six groups of students to go visit him three were like one-on-one -on -one sessions wow. uh, and we would spend the whole day with him and we went to some of his subsidiaries then we had a two and a half hour q a with warren buffett wow. and of, of course he didn't let us record it but i wrote everything down <laughs> that he said and it's in my book all those q a's and that's all fresh material you know, that's never been published before. So that was one of the things that convinced me, oh, hey, I got some new stuff that I can put in a, in a book if I want to write a book. Yeah. So I, you know, and we did that. And then we went out to lunch with him. And then, uh, you know, I sat right next to him at lunch, right across from him. My wife was with me and uh, she was there as well, and we got to ask him some questions. I didn't really have that many questions for him because I I had already written three uh, articles about him. So I knew all about him, and I grew up in Omaha. Yeah. And he's from Omaha, and I went to high school with his son, Peter. Uh -huh. And my brother went to high school with Howie, who's going to be the next chairman of the board. Yeah. And my cousin uh, went to high school, the same high school, Omaha Central, with uh, Susie. So I, I've got a connection with the the Buffett family, uh, and that, that helped out, and that gave me some uh, uh, initial push mm -hmm. to learn more about him. And uh, then the whole university thing came up where I could go visit him for a day with my students. And that was awesome. The students just loved it, you know, and, and we all had our picture taken with him when we visited him and we visited these subsidiaries. And uh, I asked my students afterwards, I go, I go, so what was the, the most important thing you learned from Warren Buffett? And uh, they didn't say anything about money. They said that it was how to live your life. It, it was the lessons that, that they learned from him related to his values. That was a surprise to me. I think Warren Buffett's values really just touch so many people's lives. It's a lot of people when the first time we, they think of Warren Buffett, maybe they just think that he's a capitalist, right? He loves money. But the more that you read about him, the more that you understand him, you realize that he is such a kind person, so generous, so much wisdom and values inside him. That's why he become the most respected investor in the whole entire world. I think that it's truly amazing. And going back to when you mentioned about you managed to got like three opportunities, these very rare opportunities to bring your entire group of students go there to learn from Warren Buffett direct for an entire day. I know that it wasn't an easy journey as well. At first, in your book, you actually mentioned that yeah. you were actually rejected first. However, you overcame that with creativity and all this. So can you share with us a little bit about what was going through in your mind at that time and how did you actually eventually clinch that opportunities? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I learned that he was bringing universities to Omaha. Uh, he loves to teach, by the way. He would have been a teacher if it wasn't uh, for him being an investor. And uh, so you had to apply 
So I immediately put together a one page letter to him and I told him what I was doing. I had a nonprofit while I was a professor and uh, I was teaching kids entrepreneurship on the side. You know, I wasn't getting paid for it. It was all, you know, pro bono stuff. Uh, and I thought that that would be really cool. And and also I put in the letter that, hey, I went to high school with your, your son, Pete. Oh, nice. <laughs> I thought for sure that that would get me in. I got rejected. And I, me knowing his son didn't help. The secretary said, don't even bother to put your name. <clears throat> the list is years long to go visit him. Don't even waste your time. And so I didn't put my name on the list and I was always very kind of, oh, I should have put my name on the list. You know, that, that was a mistake. Uh, so I started, I wanted to learn as much as I could about Warren Buffett. So I started uh, researching and writing a, a case study about him. And uh, over a two year period, I wrote this case study wow. and uh, um, then I got it published. And then I had an epiphany why don't I send this case study to Warren Buffett to try and get invited to go visit him? Maybe that will put, put him over the edge. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I sent it overnight express to differentiate myself from everybody else. And within, within about 10 days, I got a letter back from Omaha, Nebraska with this address I didn't recognize. And it was a letter from Warren Buffett uh, thanking me for writing such a nice case study about him. And he was inviting me in November of 2009, nice. which was, you know, the year 2009 was the Great Recession when yeah. it ended right around that time. And the, that weekend we ended up going up there uh, was the same weekend he bought Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. So mm -hmm. all these uh, people, these journalist were following him around trying to, to get him to answer questions but he didn't want to have anything to do with with uh, the journalist because he was with us mm. he wanted to spend time with the students he cared about the students he mm. wanted to help them he just loves to teach mm. he loves people and he wants to help people period mm. but students he really enjoys doing that so I did that three times, two other times, uh, and I also took three groups of students to the shareholder meeting, mm. uh, and that's a whole other story <laughs> to itself. I've been to 15 shareholder meetings. Oh. How many have you been to? This year was the second time, so next year oh. was my first time. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. I will see you again next year. Yeah, definitely. I'll probably be at that book signing again. Awesome. I will definitely bring some of my followers, my students. Oh, uh, good. Okay. <laughs> You're great. <laughs> so I can see that there's so much persistence in you that you don't take no for an answer. Most of the time when people get rejected, you know, if they do not have the entrepreneurship spirit, they will think, okay, never mind. No, it's a no, right? However, you went all out. You took two years to write and research and publish a paper and you still want to use it as a chance to get yourself in. And I think that is amazing, amazing attitude and spirit that we all can learn from you as well. Not just well, I think, you, from I you. I think you have to be entrepreneurial today. You have to think differently than what everybody else is doing. And that's true in investments as well. Mm. You, just, you just have to be different. You have to go against the trend to separate yourself from everybody else. And it, for me, it worked. Mm. And let me tell you, I was dancing for quite a while after I got that letter from Warren. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be jumping up and down if I <laughs> I was having a great time by myself. <laughs> oh, how nice. The, he, he's so down to earth. He's so humble. You know, these are some of the things that, that why he's so successful, because he doesn't have a big head. He doesn't live where all the other billionaires live. He lives in, in a very conservative Midwestern working class 
you know, the, the people there are very humble and they work very hard. And that's that's where he grew up. That's where his family uh, was. And he still has family that's there as well. And, and what's really interesting is the effect that Warren Buffett has had on Omaha, Nebraska, and all the money that people have made off of Warren Buffett and all the money that they put into Omaha, especially into healthcare. Mm -hmm. So now Omaha is the leading place in the United States for liver transplants. Wow. The healthcare wow. is incredible. They've got a new 11 story cancer building. When Warren Buffett enriched the, not just the shareholders, but also the entire Omaha in terms of like, I think it's hit, like what you said, the influence goes beyond just the Berkshire Hathaway, but to the environment around it. And, and you wouldn't know because he's consistently said he will not put his name on anything. You know, you could be driving by a building, a hockey arena, and that could be Warren Buffett's money that built the hockey arena. I think the thing that really that people love about Warren Buffett and why we go to the shareholder meeting. There's 40,000 people that go to the shareholder meeting every year is because they trust him. Sure. They want to learn about investments, but they know he's not going to be lying to them. It's the same reason why he's the first person that's on TV when things start to go wrong. When COVID happens, who's the first person they talk to on TV? Warren Buffett on CNBC. When the Great Recession happened, who's the person on TV? Warren Buffett. The world trusts Warren Buffett. And he even said, I believe it was, I'm not sure if it was at the meeting, but I, I heard him say that he and the late Charlie Munger both loved it when people trusted them, that people could rely on them because people's money is with Warren Buffett, their savings, their life savings. He has a responsibility to all these people, to the, to the 40,000 shareholders that show up every year at the arena. Um, you know, he takes it very seriously. He, he does not want to lose that, yeah. that, that respect the trust that he's gained from people. And that's probably one of the biggest things that I've learned from him from writing the book and getting to know him is the importance of integrity. Yeah. And that's what he said, right? Like reputation takes a long time to build, but it just takes three minutes to destroy it. So you, if you know this, you will think differently, but not differently. That's for sure. Wow. And how is it like the first time when you got invited to meet Warren Buffett for the first time. How, what was going through on your mind like that you see this legend right in front of you? There, there is something that he said that, that had resonated with me, uh, and I think about it almost every day. <laughs> and being a professor, you know, it, I'm, I'm not a typical academic. I didn't get my PhD till I was uh, 33. I had two businesses before that. I grew up in a family business. You know, I've been working since I was five. So I'm a very much so not an academic, although I'm in academia. I don't really fit very well. So uh, I've always had the feeling of, of that academia is off base. We're, we're not giving the students real world hands on knowledge that they need to to, to be successful in the real world. And the best way to do that would probably be through uh, internships. But, you know, meeting Warren Buffett, to me, it was like shaking his hand and looking at him. It, it was a little intimidating because I know he's trying to read me. A and I'm looking at him and, and I'm trying to read him, I guess. <laughs> uh, and, uh, he, uh, I, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to determine, can I trust this person mm. when he first meets you? Mm. Uh, you know, because there, there's research out there that says 
that, you know, you can really sum somebody up in about 15 seconds after meeting them. And he, you know, again, I'm going to go back to the whole trust thing. That That's a really big thing for Warren Buffett. So he had a friend, I'll tell you a little story. He had a friend, uh, Joe Rosenstein, and uh, he was in uh, over in Europe during World War II, and he was he was Jewish and he was hiding from the Nazis. And so somebody turned him in while he was hiding from the Nazis. You know, he didn't know who did it, but he ended up in a concentration camp. And, you know, eventually he survived and he came to the United States and he became friends with Warren Buffett. Wow. So Warren, you know, he said to us over lunch, he, he said that when he meets somebody, he's trying to determine whether or not this person would turn me into the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Trust. Trust is so important to him. You know, I really emphasize that um, probably not enough in my book, more so here. Mm, I see that trust at the end of the day is the foundation to humans relationship. And when we are able to have the trust, that's when I think things become so, so much easier. We also become happier knowing that the person is going to help us, going to protect us, and we are going to take care of each other. And I think that's what Warren Buffett also value a lot. And, and I think over the years, he grew so much more and more into understanding the importance of relationship, right? So, so that's how we are also learning, become wiser over time. So for yourself, um, in the recent Berkshire AGM, you were actually one of the speaker, right? In Gabley Conference. And you actually shared an unheard story when you were on the way to Berkshire Omaha meeting. Uh, and are you able to share with us a little bit more about that very interesting unheard story about Warren Buffett? Yeah, I had no idea I was going to get the reaction that I got. I'm on the way to Omaha on, on a plane, and there's these two older women on my left. And I'm thinking, you know, do I want to talk to them or don't? Do I not want to talk to them? And I thought, well, they're probably going to the Berkshire shareholder meeting. So I asked them if they were going to the meeting, and they said, yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to the meeting. And uh, and so we ended up getting into a conversation, and one was a retired CFP, uh, and uh, uh, the other one was about her age, and she was a friend of hers, and they were both going to the shareholder meeting, and they were staying at the Hilton, and they were telling me that the Hilton charged them $1,000 a night, you know, to stay yeah. there, and you have to pay a year in advance to go to the Hilton. And, and if, if you can't make it, then you lose your money. And uh, uh, so the the lady, not the CFP, but the other lady starts telling me, oh, I've got a story, a Warren Buffett story for you. And so she starts to tell me that her niece uh, has MS. And her niece wrote Warren Buffett a letter. And uh, uh, she didn't tell me very much about what was in the letter, but she she said that she didn't ask for anything in the letter. You know, a couple of weeks go by, and lo and behold, she gets a call, and it's it's from Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett starts, you know, this relationship, a friendship with her over the next, you know, I, I don't know how long it was, but he started calling her a couple times a week. So here, here, somebody just sent him a letter. She asked him, <laughs> she asked him, you know, Warren, I got a question for you. You, you probably get all these letters and packages and all this stuff from people. Why did you decide to call me? Mm. And, and he said, because you didn't ask me for anything. Mm. Meaning that, you know, you, you, you're, What's a good way to put it? Mm. You're genuine mm. would probably be the best way to put it. Mm. Because, you know, Warren Buffett's probably, he probably gets millions of letters from people and they all want something from him. So after I said that, that little story to at the Gabelli conference, there was like 900 people um, 
that were listening and and they kind of roared with cl clapping and hoorah hooray and i i just i kept on talking and i said you know warren and charlie there's so much more to them than money and investments you know it's things like this that make them who they are that mm. that's why we're here is because of things like that that's right and i can also see that warren is such a down to earth person like we say so approachable that you never expect him to just call uh uh to him it's just a letter right the person he he didn't know anything about the person but he just reach out and he's so kind with, I think, his own time and with his own, I mean, wisdom, right? Because he basically just want to reach out and see how he can help that person as well. There's, a, you know, there's another author that was uh, at the book signing. I, Jillian, I don't know if you know her, Jillian Zoe Siegel. Mm -hmm. She wrote a book. I think it was in 2015 and and she interviewed a lot of famous people about the mistakes that they made and how they uh made it to the top like mike bloomberg and she, she interviewed uh buffett but it took her you know i remember her telling the story it took her like four times persistence to get in she just wanted a 15 minute interview with him and that he the secretary rejected her, uh, Diane ba Bosnick, I think is her name, mm -hmm. uh, rejected her the first time. And then uh, I think the second time she might have called and she got rejected. Mm -hmm. And then the third time, I think she went into the office. <laughs> I mean, she did not quit. She kept on going. And, and I think the fourth time she finally got in to see him and she had a photographer with her he didn't really like the photographer there <laughs> and uh she was only supposed to spend 15 minutes with him and she ended up spending a, a, a about an hour with him wow wow so it's possible hmm. you know her angle was just for her book you know my angle was to get invited to with all yeah. my students yeah so I think you, you would take some, it would take some creativity if you wanted to somehow, uh, you know, go out to lunch with him at Garotz or something like that, you know. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to go visit him, you would have to be able to say, to say, hey, I got to get on a flight. I got to go to Omaha. I'm going to spend, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to spend the money so I can go out to lunch with Warren Buffett. And I'm, you know, going to take notes down and I'm going to build this relationship with him. And it's not going to be a one-off. It's going to be a continuous relationship with him. Wow. And I think that's what is worth it. Because once that, that door is open, there is a lot more deeper relationship and connections that, that I think anyone yeah. is capable yeah, of. Yeah, now, now Jillian... Uh, it, she gets invited to, uh, uh, there's a dinner on Friday and Saturday night and a brunch. She goes to that with Warren and all of his friends. And oh, beautiful. It's maybe beautiful. that could be you someday, Chloe. I, I could see you doing that. that. I will work hard on that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Todd. Now, my next question will be related to investing. And uh, Warren Buffett always emphasized on the importance of temperament. However, we also know that controlling our emotion is not easy. So do you think temperament is something that can be cultivated? Or do you think it's more people are born with it? I, I think uh, I've got a whole chapter in my book about uh, behavioral finance and I didn't really know very much about behavioral finance before I wrote the book so it was like learning a whole new field and I went through the whole history of behavioral finance in a couple pages because I didn't want to bore people with the history of it you know and I talked about Dan Ariely at, at Duke who's a very famous 
guy in the field and Richard Thaler, uh, who's another very, very famous guy at the University of Chicago. Uh, and then I talk about uh, all the different types of behavioral biases that there are, but I, I talk about the seven biggest ones and I define them. Uh, and I give examples of some of the mistakes that Warren Buffett made using these behavioral biases. And then I talk about how you can overcome those biases. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, that's the best chapter in the whole book mm. is on behavioral finance because both Warren and Charlie have said many, many times that that's the most important thing in investing is your temperament. I think over the years, I have also grown to become better in my controlling my own emotion. So I, oh, of course, there are times that I still struggle. However, I felt that by reading, really just using all this wisdom from, uh, from Warren, from Charlie to calm ourselves down, it helps a lot. Yeah. So to me, I think it can be cultivated, although not easy, but I think it's a journey that is worth going for. Do you rem remember what I wrote about what Richard Thaler said? Can you uh, give me some hint? About investing and and behavioral finance and how often you should look at your portfolio? Oh, yes. You talk about like his advice. It's no more than once a year, right? Because the more that you do it, the more mistakes that you tend to make. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, of course, I don't do that, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's probably what I should do. He says to go ahead and pick a mix of stocks versus bonds, say like 70-30, you know, and set it and then look at it maybe once or twice a year, you know, June and December and leave it alone. Or, you know, at the end of the year or the middle of the year, then you could rebalance your portfolio if you need to. Uh, and th that's what he says. And he, he says it's work for me. Mm. Uh, and Ariely is a, a little story about Ariely. This guy's brilliant mm. at Duke. He said during the Great Recession that he locked himself out of his investment so he couldn't get in. So he couldn't see how bad they were doing because he knew that that would affect his, his uh, behavior. Mm. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, that's right. It's about controlling your environment. If you have no choice but to not look at it, then you will not look at it and you will not do silly things. And, and knowing your weaknesses. Yeah. Wow. Mm. But Aware. behavioral finance, I'll tell you, you know, I'll be honest with you, you know, after I, I wrote this stuff, I've done a lot better with mm. investing. Wow. Because you become more cognizant of your your own biases and you don't do at least me, I don't do as stupid of things as I used to. So it's really about that awareness. And once we understand our strength and weakness, we avoid those weakness, right? Because it's really hard to overcome. Then we design our environment in a way that we become better. It, it's uh, And it's extremely difficult because... A lot of it will depend on your, your background as well. You know, what kind of a background do you come from? Do you come from a family that never had anything? Mm. A poor background? Certainly that's going to affect the way that you invest. You don't want to lose. And that's where loss aversion would come into play, that bias. Because when you lose money, it's twice as painful as it is to make money. Daniel Kahneman wrote about that. He's a Nobel Prize winner. Yeah. And it takes even harder to get back your capital <laughs> because you need to double it right now. <laughs> wow. So, you know, to your listeners out there, I would study behavioral finance and financial markets. And I would really hit on that hard to try and understand your own weaknesses. And you could paper trade mm -hmm. and learn from your mistakes uh, as your paper trading, of course, there's no substitute for actual trading, but that that would be a way to keep track of your trades mm. and the stupid things that you do, because we all do stupid things. Mm. Yeah, 
and that's what mongers say, right? Why they are so successful is they they try they just avoid doing stupid things. <laughs> they avoid doing stupid things. Yeah, that's <laughs> so true. <laughs> so I, I miss Charlie. <laughs> how is Charlie in person? Like, do you? I also you know I I was gonna go meet Charlie. You know, I sent Charlie my book. I had to send Warren my book and Charlie to get it approved. And uh, of course it got approved. And nice. um, I, I never got a chance to meet him. Uh, although a friend of mine was really pushing me hard to go out there because we both knew he was going to die soon. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I screwed up. I should have gone out there and said, Hey, you know, I'll, meet you at your house for lunch or whatever, or somehow come up with a way to meet Charlie Munger. You know, I wasn't aggressive enough. I made a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. I should have been more aggressive. Mm. Thanks for sharing your lessons learned as well from there. And we feel inspired right now that we should, if it's something that we really want to achieve, we should go for that. Right? We should yep. not let yep. any excuses or fear that stop us. Yep, exactly. Going back to Warren Buffett, right? he has this advice that most in retail investors should just focus on buying the low-cost index fund, which in this case is S&P 500. And in fact, uh, he even wheels 90% right, of his wife's money when he passed on will go to S&P. Why is it that he will do that, in your opinion, compared to maybe just put it inside Berkshire Hathaway stocks? Well, there was a big argument between Charlie and uh, Warren uh, about that. So Warren said that it would be better uh, to invest in the S&P 500. Charlie thought it would be better to go ahead and invest in Berkshire Hathaway. Charlie was a hardcore Berkshire Hathaway fan <laughs> and Warren, not much, not, not as much. So, and, you know, I, I was thinking about that the other day and I was thinking, well, I wonder how they've been doing in my book. I, I look at the past 10 years yeah. and they underperform the S and P 500. Uh, but uh, lately I've been looking yes. at the past five years yes. and they've underperformed mm -hmm. the last five years through 2023 by 24%. Mm. Um, but they are outperforming the S&P this year. Yeah. I think by like 4%. Mm. But that's a good reason right there. Why why Warren that and they have 190 billion dollars in cash earning 5% and the market's up like 11 or 12%. So that's going to put you behind the market. Mm. 190 billion and they're probably their market cap is probably somewhere around 750 billion. I think Warren's Warren, he's just more careful, I guess, that you want to make sure that regardless, the the with or without him around, the company will even though he cannot steer the ship anymore, but well, investing in SP founder, you just cannot go wrong with that, right? So yeah, that's probably the well, reason. You know, I think you can't go wrong with Berkshire Hathaway. I think he's got it set up where they're going to do good. Uh, and there's there's going to be some changes that happen when he passes away. Greg Abel will take over. And Ajit Jain will be the number two. Todd Coombs and Ted Weschler will be the investment guys. Yeah. But I've heard that they've underperformed the S&P 500 which is why Warren hasn't given them more money. Now, I can't say that with certainty, hmm. but I have heard that. Uh, and that may have something to do with why Warren wants it to go into the S&P 500 as well. But I think Berkshire in the long run is going to do okay. Hmm. So they, yeah. Greg Abel's, I've heard nothing but great things about Greg Abel. Uh, and he's done great things and, um, Ajit Jain is very well respected, um, and, and how he's going to keep the culture together. Howard uh, Buffett, as chairman of the board of directors, they've got a great board of directors. 
He's put a couple more investment guys on the, the board of directors, uh, Chris Davis and another guy from Omaha, Wally Whites. Yeah, yeah Wally Whites. So uh, I think it's going to do good. You know, when Warren dies, the stock will probably go down 5%. And then eventually, I think it'll come back. You know, you'd probably want to buy it when he dies. Yeah. <laughs> it goes down 5%, 7%. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, it's a great company. You know, Charlie, <laughs> two years ago at the meeting, Charlie basically said, you, you'd have to be a complete moron not to make money with the way that we've set this up. I think, you know, there's the risk with people today, Chloe, is that they tend to want to do everything so quick. You know, the average holding period for a stock, it, what is it, six months, seven months? You know, it's the complete opposite of, of what Warren and Charlie do. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if you buy Berkshire Hathaway, do you have that patience? Mm -hmm. You know, or do you want to bet, bet your money? on NVIDIA or Meta or Google, you know, that seems to be where everybody's going. Uh, and they're not going the value investing way. Yeah, because in general, I think that's how Warren Buffett take advantage of uh, people's, he always does the opposite, right? When people are greedy and he's always fearful, when people are fearful, that's when he goes really big. So are you able to share with us a little bit more about like he's investing thought process like how did he uh, how does he actually determine for example earnings power and all this i know you actually wrote detailedly in uh, uh like i think one to two chapters of your book using apple as a case study as well are you able to share some insights on that yeah i've got three chapters on value investing and valuation in the book and really Chloe, the reason why I wrote the book initially was because I was trying to understand Warren Buffett's secret sauce. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what his secret sauce was, uh, and I kind of had a good feeling. Uh, and, and when I went out to lunch with him, with my students, and sat across from him, the only question I asked was, how do you value a company? That was it. That was the only question I had. For Warren, and he said the discounted cash flow method. That was it. But I knew, I knew that there was more to mm -hmm. to uh, his investment process than just the uh, the discounted cash flow method. So, you know, of course, I did a lot more research in my book, and that was the hardest part of writing my book was trying to get all this. This what is what does he do? He stays within his circle of competence, right? And he got that from Phil Fisher, uh, you know, which, you know, initially he learned from Ben Graham. Uh, and then he, he focused on uh, smoking puffs on a cigarette and looking at the financials and buying undervalued companies at a margin of safety. And he learned that through Benjamin Graham. Then he moved on to Phil Fisher. And through Phil Fisher, he started to focus more so on quality companies. And Phil Fisher, I don't know, in his book, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, something like that, he had a list of things that he would look at related to investing. And it's a great book. Everybody should read that book. But he didn't just look at the financials. Sure, that was part of it. But he also looked at like the management team, you know, and and are they ethical? You know, are they uh, in it for the shareholders? Do they think for themselves or are they lemmings? Um, he looked at, at them. He looked at the uh, industry. He looked at the the moats that a company has. And to me, in my own personal opinion, after looking at the financials and some other qualitative aspects, the mode is probably the most important thing. For example, you know, there's been a lot of push on, you know, AI and the impact that AI is going to have on different companies. And and let's let's look look at Google. Everybody was kind of afraid 
of the impact that AI would have on Google. And it really hasn't had that big of an impact on their search, which is where they get most of their money from. Um, they still have like a 93% market share. That's one of the reasons why Google's done well. I'm kind of surprised, you know, that they have done so well. And, and another moat, you know, look at Amazon, Amazon's moat. I mean, how, how are you going to compete against Amazon? Is there going to be another Amazon that goes up, you know, next week? Probably not. And Jeff Bezos is probably the best manager in the world. So, you know, those are things that he looks at. Um, and he wants to buy, you know, at, at a, a value that's, you know, less, uh, uh, you know, than the intrinsic value. And then he, he looks at some other quantitative things. I, I can talk about those. Um, he wants uh, good economics, a return on uh, equity of 15 to 20%. He wants a debt to equity of less than one that can be repaid within five years. A free, strong and consistent free cash flow uh, for the DCF. Um, a, a firm that doesn't need a lot of capital. A uh, return on invested capital of 20% uh, related to inflation. He wants firms that can raise their prices, uh, such as C's Candy. C's raises their, their prices at around 10% every year, and they can get away with it. And he, he really pays a lot of attention to retained earnings. You know, what do they do with their retained earnings? You know, Apple's a great example of that. You know, that's one of the reasons why they bought Apple is because they are giving out dividends and buying back stock. They bought back like half their company over the past five years. Buffett wants 15% uh, on the day that he signs the papers when he buys a company. Or, or something to that effect. Um, so those are some of the, the quantitative things. Some other things, uh, again, is the, the moat. This is qualitative. And the management team and the industry position uh, of the firm. So those are uh, things to look at. You can find a lot of that stuff on Morningstar. And I can take you through the whole process. If somebody wants to email me, I can show you how to do it. How kind. Thank you so much, Todd. You're so sweet. Um, going back to just now you talk about the quantitative and we also talk about the importance of qualitative, like management mode and all this. So if you were to talk about the management of Berkshire um, and one day when Warren Buffett eventually departs, how would you use, if you can use one word to describe the culture and the management that Warren has set in place, what would that be? Well, I'm going to go back to uh, trust. Hmm. So uh, one thing that Warren learned, one of his mentors, it's very important to have strong mentors in your life. Warren says that, tell me who your mentors are, and I'll tell you where you're going to be in life. That's what he says. So remember that, Chloe. Who are your mentors? Warren would tell you what, what's going to happen to you if you knew who your mentors were. Mm. So Warren is probably one of your mentors. <laughs> and yes. Kind of yeah. indirectly, right? I know yeah. he is for me. Yeah, trust, you know, decentralization. Uh, Warren hates managing people. Warren's an entrepreneur. People don't understand that he's an entrepreneur. He does so many entrepreneurial things, it's not even funny. Maybe it's because my background is in entrepreneurship and I see all this stuff and other people don't. But he learned from Tom Murphy, who was uh, one of his mentors and on the board of directors, how to manage a company. And, and Tom Murphy taught him about decentralization. And you have to have trust with your managers if you're going to decentralize your company. So at his corporate headquarters, he only has 25 employees. He has one secretary, one secretary for probably a million pieces of mail that, that he gets every day. <laughs> Debbie Bosanek is her name. And I have her email and phone number, by the way. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that and being frugal is another thing that he learned from him, buying quality companies and, and don't leverage 
yourself. He learned all those things through Tom Murphy. Uh, Tom Murphy had a significant impact on Warren Buffett's life. Hmm. So trust. trust. I'm going to go back to trust again. Trust. And that is the pillar of Berkshire. How is it like when, have you ever had the opportunity to talk to, for example, RJ, Greg Abel? How are they like in person? No, but I know people that have, and uh, they all say great things. Hmm. I have never heard anything negative about Greg Abel. Wow. So that that gives me a lot of confidence. So when Warren passes away, and the way that Greg Abel handed himself at the last shareholder meeting, he, he did great. Mm -hmm. do you think? Yes, I think so too. I have yeah. complete, total confidence in that management team. <laughs> I managed to bump into Greg Abel when I was using came out from the bathroom and I was like, oh my God, is it Greg? And I said, like, can I take a picture with you? And he's so nice, so humble, so generous. And say, yeah, sure. And yeah. That's great. You, you've met him more than I have. It's <laughs> 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 the beauty about Berkshire. Like you just get to meet so many amazing people that you just never thought that you would ever meet them in life. But because it's the magic of Buffett that he's able to draw everybody to come that once a year and and i'm looking forward to see who i will manage to meet next year as well of course including you as well dr Todd. oh yeah definitely chloe i i've really gotten it's been fun getting to know you just now you talk about the importance of creativity the importance of um really get like be a be be setting our heart on something and we just do it right and if i were to write a letter to Warren Buffett, and hopefully he can reply to me. Do you have any tips and advice that can uh, give me a higher chance of maybe getting a reply from him? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, I gave you an example of me and what I did. I gave you an example of the, the, the lady with M MS mm. and what she did. Um, mm. That you know, you you're you're just gonna have to experiment mm. and maybe do some research and find out, you know, go on AI, chat GPT, and put in uh how can I how can I meet Warren Buffett? What mm. are some great ways for me to, to meet Warren Buffett? Mm. Okay. I would say the best way is through somebody that you know. That would be a great start. Do you know somebody that's good friends with Warren Buffett? You probably do. You mean Dr. Todd, you yourself? Uh, well, you could mention my name, but I'm, I can't guarantee you that that would work. Um, but I mean somebody that's really kind of in the circle, in his circle. Do, okay. you, do you know anybody that's in his circle? William Green? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he knows him or not. He, okay. he might have a better answer for you on this than me. <laughs> but I, I think that, you know, through some other people, that would be a, a possibility. Another possibility would just be through writing a, a one page note mm -hmm. uh, and not asking for anything, but, you know, doing something that's really beneficial for others. Mm, mm, mm. Great tips. I'm not saying that will work either, but you know, remember what I said it. about uh, yeah. Zoe, Zoe yeah. Siegel. Four oh, times right. she tried. Four yeah. times. That's right. It's I only tried about. tried twice. Yeah. yeah. But if anybody can do it, you can do it. Okay. You above anybody that I know can do this. Thank you. And everybody here listening, they can do it too. We just have to keep trying. Everybody else can do it too. Yes. All right. Now, what do you think is the most important lesson that you have learned from Buffett all these years? I think you talk about trust already. Do you have anything that you want to add on or you want to expand on it? You know, how to live your life and, and having integrity and being humble, you know, and... Uh respecting everybody that you meet, treating them with kindness, 
And, and he measures success through uh, how many people love him. Mm. How beautiful. So I can't, I've always kind of kept that in the back of my head. You know, he doesn't say that he measures his success by how much money he has. Of course, he's got plenty of money, so he doesn't have to worry about that. But but he also has said, and I'm sure you've heard this before, that just because you have 2X versus X doesn't mean that you're going to be any happier. And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, before we get off here about uh, happiness. I think mm -hmm. that that's something that I think everybody should be more aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and every year that I teach, I always, the, the last day of class, I talk about, you know, keys to success and, and being happy. And, uh, and I, I have all the students write down uh, what will make them personally and professionally happy. Um, and uh, then we get into a big discussion and we talk about it. And one, one year, one of the, First times that I did that, uh, I was talking about, you know, happiness and, and everything. And one girl that, that walked with a limp to class every day, uh, and, and I didn't mention this when I was talking about it, she said, my health is the most important thing to me because she got into a car accident and now she limps every day and I, it, I mean it's sad but it really taught me a lesson that day mm -hmm. that your health is the most important thing for you uh because you can't really be happy if you if you're not healthy mm -hmm. you're waking up and you're you're sick every day and so i mean money money uh, is is important but it's not going to be the all end all answer for your internal happiness. I mean, you have to have a certain amount of it, but um, there are other things, you know, I've taken a class on, on happiness. So they talk about, you know, giving to other people will make you happy. Your relationships with your family and your friends will make you happy. Um, having goals, setting goals for yourself, whatever they may be, uh, will make you happy. Um, being kind, giving back, practicing gratitude every day, you know, for what you have and uh, experiences. They, they talk about the importance of experiences rather than buying material things. You know, so, you know, go and go to Omaha and meet Warren Buffett at the mm -hmm. shareholder meeting. You know, that's something that you'll never forget. Yeah. You know, every experience that you have when you meet somebody and you do a podcast or whatever, you know, that's a great notch for you. That just puts you in a different world than everybody else. Yeah. And and I think the beauty of uh, Berkshire is you really get to connect with people who are so much wiser. And at the same time, they are so humble. And I, I felt that the two years ago, the decision of me going to Berkshire really started to transform my life. And my mindset as an investor. And, and I really, that's why I highly encourage people who have never been there, really go. It's just a very transformative journey. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, it's like we're a little family. Mm. We all have this commonality. And, and we've adopted Buffett's value system. It's like the people there, you're probably going to get people with the same values as Warren Buffett, and you can trust them. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just my insights and what I think. I don't know if it's true, but I, I feel as though I've met a lot of really great people by going to the, to the shareholder meeting and a lot of smart people, really smart, uh, a lot smarter than me. That's why you will keep going every single year for the past 15 years, in fact. Yeah, it, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I used to take my students to it, but I'm too busy now when I go to the meetings. And the students loved it. We used to stay up. We we would get there at about 2.30 in the morning. Oh my so God, basically, basically, we stayed up all night 
we would go to the side entrance on the right. I don't know if you know where, where that's at. And we would be like the six people in line every year. And we'd see the same people there every year. Wow. <laughs> you know, this, this lawyer from California would come there and he'd have his little chair and he'd be sitting out there at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and there was this guy uh, who told me about investing in Google. And that was like 12 years ago. He was talking about it. Uh, and uh, you just really meet some exciting, interesting people from all over the world. Yeah. And many of them are very patient. Some of the older people that I talked to, they held onto Bookshare for like, what, 30 years, 40 years? They are so financially enriched. And at the same time, I think so happy, right? Because of the values that Warren Buffett has given and, and taught them over the years. You should get one of them on your podcast. You, <laughs> should get, you should get one of the original investors with Warren Buffett on your podcast or somebody from their family uh -huh. to see okay. how, how that transformed their life, their family's life by being one of the in original investors with Warren Buffett in their partnership. I, I don't know them personally. No, I know the Davis family, uh, you know, he was a, an MD and I think he, he gave Warren a hundred thousand mm, dollars. Mm. This is a lot of money in the partnership days from 56 yes. to 69. Yeah, that was so many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that'd be a great idea for you. Mm, that's right. And if I come across I anybody, I'll let you know. Thank you. I would love that. Thank you so much for your help. And I think Bertie, uh, it's uh, I would love to interview her as well, being being initially invested by herself to eventually she basically get Warren Buffett to invest for her and her life completely changed. How interesting. And you would be a great uh, person to talk to. Yeah. I know, right? And she's so gorgeous. <laughs> Even though she's already old but then she you can can see she exudes that elegance that peace in her right uh birdie is warren buffett's sister yeah so now um one more question is imagine today you know you have lived as long as you wanted and you have accomplished every single thing that you have wanted to accomplish in your life and today is the last day and you will have to uh, when you depart, you have to take away all the work that you have published, for example, the book and everything. You won't be able to leave it behind. So if that happens, what will be that three advice that you want to leave to people? And these will be the only three advice that we and whoever who is listening able to get from you. Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, some of the stuff I already said about happiness, I think applies to to what you just said is is uh you know try try to live a happy and fulfilled life and relationships have a lot to do with that and uh you don't necessarily have to have get married uh it's not a requirement or have children but you know relationships with with others in your family and experiences um of course you have to make money in order to do things like that, but you don't have to dedicate your entire life to, to just work. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, was a time where I was not like that, you know, during the PhD program, you're working all the time. So uh, there may be times in your life where you don't have that choice, but, you know, I think, uh, I think just helping people. I remember Chloe, I didn't, say anything about this, but I probably should. You know, when I was younger, my first job out of college was uh, being a, a, a marketing rep for a Fortune 500 company, mm -hmm. and I was making great money. Mm -hmm. And I had a company car, uh, but I was miserable. Mm -hmm. I was not happy at all. Uh, even though I was making all this money. So I knew that I had my values all screwed up. You know, it's okay to make money if you're happy while you're doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're not happy with what you're doing, you, you need to change your life. And you need to find your passion 
Mm -hmm. uh, and as long as you can make a living doing it, you know, sometimes uh, just your passion alone is not enough. Um, so you have to be cognizant of that. But yeah, so, you know, I was doing that for money and I was miserable. And, and so I went back to school and I got an MBA and then I went and got a PhD. And uh, when I started my PhD program and I started to teach, after the first day that I taught, I knew that I had found what I wanted to do. And the feeling that I got from teaching, from helping others was unmatched in anything that I had done in my life up to that point. I felt so content. content. I had found what I wanted to do with my life. I, I just felt that that should be something that I should share with your audience. Thank you. It's really about finding what you love to do and make the best out of what. It's like life purpose, right? It's like what you say, Warren Buffett. If he didn't become an investor, he actually enjoys teaching so much. And he also had this famous quote that if you love what you do, you don't have to work, right? It's not about like, you don't feel like you're working. It's just enjoying it. That's why he tap dance to work every day. Lastly, um, how can people find out more about you and your work? In fact, one of our uh, followers, uh, one of our audience here is asking, how can I become your student as well? <laughs> uh, I... Uh... Uh, have my book for sale on Amazon. It's in 13 languages. It will be in Chinese. Whoa. It's in the Chinese version, I think, in Singapore and Taiwan. And the other Chinese is coming out on the mainland oh, is wow. going to be out in March. And I've got, you know, Spanish and Italian and a couple others that are already in print. If you want to buy a book from me, I can autograph it for you. I've got some books behind me, and then I can send that out directly to you. Uh, also, if you wanted to check out uh, and learn more about me personally, my uh, uh, LinkedIn page has a ton of material on there, and Chloe's all over the place on my LinkedIn page. Just kidding. Thank you so uh, and, much for sharing uh, my post. You are so good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and, you know, Facebook, I'm on there, and uh, Instagram. Uh, my university, Gonzaga University, I've got a web page there. Uh, I have a website, toddfinkel.com as well. So I'm all over the place. That's awesome. And that's how there are so many different places that we can always continue to learn from you. And we're definitely looking forward to see more of your work uh, being translated to more languages. And maybe you are in the process of conceptualizing your next book, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I thought about it. <laughs> Somebody wanted me to update this book, uh, but I'm, I'm not so sure that I want to do that. I I'm thinking a something about AI so I can be on the cutting edge of a different field. Uh, yeah. It will be very interesting. And at the end of the day, it's really about loving what you do. And I'm very sure that we can continue to learn so much more from you as you continue to evolve, become better as an investor, as a as an author, and as a teacher. So And you need to continue to do what you do, Chloe, because we're learning from you and all the people that you bring on uh, your show. And we're very fortunate to have you. Uh, being part of our community. Thank you so much. It's such an honor of me to be able to learn from you guys, from all of you, learn from Dr. Todd today. Most importantly, keep learning, go and get this book. And uh, if you are going to Bookshare AGM, Dr. Todd will also be there to autograph it next year. <laughs> so you can bring this along. If not, you can also get a copy on the spot, just like how I did. And thanks so much for your beautiful wisdom here as well. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Thank you for your time. And thanks everybody for joining us as well. We will see you in the next podcast. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Todd. Bye. Bye. <laughs>